Good morning. Well, what we are doing this morning now is that we are turning in our Bibles to Psalm 42, which is to be directly connected to Psalm 43. They are meant to be, in essence, one entity. What you are doing as you're turning now to Psalm 42 is that you are realizing at this point you've entered into what is known as Book 2 in the Psalms. Now, as we pointed out in our insert this morning, or if you're watching online, it should, there should be something there to offer further explanation. Book 1 has an emphasis upon a particular name of God. Yahweh is in the Hebrew. That is the covenantal, relational, personal name for God. It was very national in the way in which this name was stressed among the Israelite people within the land of Israel. But when you get into book two, what you're going to notice is that there's a shifting in the emphasis upon the naming of our God. You're going to notice that in book one, it would be capital L-O-R-D, all capitalized. But when you get into book two, the emphasis seems to be upon G-O-D, but in the Hebrew, it's Elohim. Why? Book one tends to be very nationalistic. Book two tends to be very universalistic, international. Goes beyond the borders of Israel. It's as if now the psalmist is now expanding the horizons and, and getting the Gentile population as well as the Jewish people to begin to explore the richness and understanding of who God is and what God has taught in his word. That's a major distinctive between book one and book two. Book one deals with the idea of God being the one who's involved, you see, in, in confrontation with the enemies of his plan. Book two now, communication pertaining to the richness of his plan. And so we tie that together. There will be more to cover in the coming weeks. You're going to notice with me that this is meant for the choir master. So once again now, what we find is that this song is going to be a teaching song because you're going to see here at the top of, the, of this psalm is that this is called a maskeel. Now a maskeel was a song that was meant to instruct. It was meant to teach. It was meant to uh, provide wisdom for people so that they would be skilled in the way in which they live life. So now you've got something universal, Jew and Gentile alike. And furthermore, what you will see is that this is a masculine of the sons of Korah. Now, as I've noted for you in your insert, you're going to want to check out sometime this week, Numbers 16. They will tell you a little bit about the sons of Korah and the fact that they rebelled against God's will and the leader at that time, Moses, how God dealt with the people, and yet at the same time, God would still extend mercy and allow subsequent generations to be so used of God that you will find here these psalms, part of what are known as the Sons of Korah songs. So I'm going to begin reading in Psalm 42. I'll take it down through the end of this particular psalm, but we've got to bear in mind is that this has got to be connected to what we'll cover next week in Psalm 43. They're meant as one. You're going to find recurring phrases, and the emphasis here is upon what we'll develop in our thinking this morning, how to address spiritual depression. In particular, how do you deal with what is known as the downcast soul, which is just one of many forms of depression. You pick it up now with me in verse 1 as I read. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. Notice how many times it's G-O-D rather than capital L-O-R-D now. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? 
My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Well, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Now the first of three times the question we posed in these, uh, these twin psalms. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And notice the pendulum keeps swinging back and forth. My soul's cast down within me, and therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and Hermon and from Mount Mitzar, and deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. It's as if now he feels like he's drowning, overwhelmed. Ever been there? By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. Did you notice that he's now incorporated capital L-O-R-D after all this? By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forsaken me, forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Notice the physical elements here. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Now for a second time, a second time, you will once again find these words. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, <clears throat> for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God, you see. And so we're going to be exploring today and next week the concept, the idea of spiritual depression. There are various forms of depression. Some are very biological in, or, in origins, genetic perhaps. Others have to do with circumstances of life. But through it all, what you and I are to do is to do what this psalmist has done, what God has set up as a model for us to do, is to take inventory, go deep, ask the tough questions with regard to our souls as we look to our Lord now in prayer. And so, our Father, we want to do that. We're going to go deep, ask the tough questions, examine our souls, take spiritual inventory. We realize that some of these issues we deal with in the area of depression are, may not necessarily be the downcast soul matter. If it's biological, we need to get things checked out. But if there is something that is so related, that too needs to be checked out. Which is what we'll try to do here today. So, Father, prior service, the service, online, gatherings throughout the course of the days to come, those that are watching online, whether it be nearby or we know of cases in various, various states across the country and beyond. In one accord now, Father, collectively, we are coming together before you as we open up your word. 
warm these hearts, engage these minds, and shape these wills. As again, our Father, we've come here to see Jesus and him only. And we're praying these things again now in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, they probably would not have expected him to say it, but he said it. I am the subject of depressions of spirit so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such an extreme as that which I go through. So said Charles Spurgeon, one of the most acknowledged pastors in all of time. The year was 1866. You wouldn't think that this particular pastor would go through what we might call the valley of despair. Personally, I have often passed through this dark valley, he said again in 1887. And you have to wonder that perhaps, perhaps, one of the reasons Mr. Spurgeon was able to bring such extraordinary comfort to so many people was that he knew the problem of discouragement and perhaps even depression firsthand. What I want to do with you this morning is to think about this together. This whole matter of what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, physician turned pastor of Westminster Chapel in London, would refer to in one of his volumes as spiritual depression. A professor of mine, back in my days of doing master's degree work, Dr. Gary Collins wrote in the book with regard to counseling the depressed. I used to tell my students that depression is one of the most challenging problems for counselors, often caused by a combination of physical and psychological influences. Depression is like a snarled rope, difficult to untangle, holding thousands of people in a, a blind of despair and loneliness. And who could guess just how many articles and books, popular and technical, have addressed this subject and offered its victims and its counselors varying degrees of suggestions. But we're going to turn to God's word, and we're going to allow God's word, verse by verse, to begin to address this issue. And this morning, if you say to yourself, this is not where I'm at, chances are you hang with some people where this is exactly where they're at. And you're not to be a reservoir of truth. You and I are to be channels of truth. And we allow the flow of scripture to pass from us to them so that they can move from the generic understanding of God to a personal relationship with capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Okay. And so this will be our on-ramp this morning as we're trying to figure out how do you reach the heart, the soul of the person you see who's going through what's being described in these verses. Well, let's check it out. Because first of all, in verses 1 through 4, as you and I, as we consider the nature of the downcast soul, I want you to begin with me by noting here how the past is being remembered. Watch carefully how he moves from present to past. Now we pick it up here, this masculine, this teaching psalm. And here in verse 1, you and I give, are given a sense that wherever this psalmist is, he's in a far distant region, and he is living in the midst of what we might call drought conditions. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. Now notice that he references a deer. Is he out in the wilderness? We know he's in exile. We know that he's far removed from his people, the Jews. There's a sense of aloneness here. 
But what we find is that there is this image of a deer that seems to have captured his attention. Is it illustrative of what's going on inside his soul? As a deer pants for flowing streams, it's looking, it's moving about, can't find it, wants to be able to hydrate. We are in a dehydrated culture when it comes to all things spiritual, needing living water. As a deer pants, He's watching now the movements of the deer physically, pondering the parched experience that their deer is facing and linking it to self. It's panting for flowing streams. Too many in our culture are settling for stagnant ponds. When God offers living water, you see, flowing streams of life. Which is it for you? Settling for uh, stagnant ponds? Or you're pursuing flowing streams? This deer is, and evidently so is the psalmist. But he goes on to say, now he creates this linkage between the deer and self. So pants my soul For you, O God, which tells me now we're dealing with a mature believer who's hurting. So let's discard the notion that if somebody's hurting, if somebody has fallen into depression, therefore that person must be spiritually immature. Let's slay that one right now. There are various reasons, my gracious. It could be biological. There could be something in the endocrine system that needs to be checked out. As a deer pants for flowing streams. Now, he's showing his spiritual maturity at this point. So pants my soul. Isn't that interesting? He's going inward. He's going deep. And it could be, if nothing satisfies in life, it's because you haven't gone deep enough. We might very well be experiencing what we might call this morning parched souls. So thirsty, longing for hydration, but nothing seems to truly hydrate. Maybe we haven't looked far enough. Maybe it is that we need to look upward as well as inward. The psalmist does. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul. Notice how he gets pissed now here for you. But at this point, he doesn't say, oh my God. You feel the distancing here? Oh, God, he'll get to my God a little later on. He's got to work this thing through. And maybe for various of us here in person and those watching online, don't settle for a shallow pond. Go deep. Begin to examine the my soul matter and move from God to my God in this dynamic. Joe Bailey did. Jill Bailey, a writer, extraordinary writer, wrote various poems. I'm alone, Lord, alone a thousand miles from home. In his verses from a psalm in a hotel room. There's no one here who knows my name except the clerk, and he spelled it wrong. No one to eat dinner with. Laugh at my jokes. Listen to my gripes. Be happy with me about what happened today and say, that's great. No. No one cares. 
It was just this lousy bed and slush in the street outside between the buildings. And I feel sorry for myself, and I have plenty of reason to. Maybe I ought to say I am on top of it. Praise the Lord. Things are great, but they're not. Tonight, it's all gray slush. Hmm. So wrote a man who was powerfully used by God in his writings to lead countless people to Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord. Going through some gray slush lately. Well, now, the psalmist at this point, uh, he is he going inward. He's exploring now the, the inner workings of his being, the soul center of life. He's not going to work this thing out on the periphery. Neither should you. Neither should I. He's not going to blame others. He's got to figure this thing out between he and God. You're up to verse 2. Notice he says here, my soul thirsts for God. He's identified just what it is and who it is that he is thirsting for. Now, what a lot of people do is that they try to meet this form of spiritual depression by accumulating things, purchasing things, filling up their schedule with endless activity, making certain that the social calendar is overflowing so they can numb what is taking place within. But now, notice what he's doing. He says, I refuse to be numbed. This is spiritual maturity in the midst of the drought conditions of life. My soul thirsts for God. And now notice this, the living God. Match this to your Newer Testament talks about living water. What we're finding now is that he is beginning to pursue what he will call real hydration. Authentic hydration. Not merely for the lips, but for the soul. My soul here, not merely my lips, not merely my throat. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. But now in a series of questions that he is grappling with, that perhaps you and I wrestle with as well, and the first of which appears in two, where he then asks the when question. When shall I come and appear before God? What I see here at this point is that there is social disconnect. There is congregational disconnect. He wants to be in the presence of God, perhaps in a setting such as Jerusalem. But when he poses the when question, and we need to be asking that of our souls, we've got to connect it. And we've got to connect it to God. The when. Not merely how long will this last. You've got to connect the when question to God. He does. When shall I come and appear before God? He wants to get back to where, where the action is in his mind. But I want to say to the psalmist at this point, could it be that the action is right where you're at? Right now. And he wants to engage you in your own drought condition with living waters. You've identified the need. And furthermore, you've got this sense of whenness. When shall I come? I, I want this thing to end. Clock's ticking, getting older. Things to do, places to go, people to hang with. 
the when question of life. When shall I come, he asks in verse 2, and appear and appear before God. How long, O oh Lord? Do you feel this sense of isolation? But what I want to say at this point is if you feel socially isolated, don't transfer that into becoming spiritually isolated. Many a missionary has had to do work all alone in settings where people just don't get it. They don't take the physical isolation of life and transfer that into a spiritual isolation from God through life. The Apostle John was isolated on the Isle of Patmos. Yet it was in his isolation socially on the Isle of Patmos that God integrated his soul with an extraordinary understanding of the cosmic sovereign one Lord over all, past, present, future, through a series of visions in the book of Revelation. While he might have been wondering what pertaining to the emperor of Rome at that time, John the Apostle, how long? So when shall I come and appear before God? Oh, I want to say, don't you want to say this to him? But God's omnipresent. You don't have to be in Jerusalem to have an encounter with the living God. And you don't have to have the perfect conditions of life to have an encounter with the living God. Don't try to create ideal conditions this side of heaven for all of a sudden intimacy with God to be experienced. God brings that form of dynamic into the less than ideal experiences of life to arouse a world that is parched in soul to understand where living water is really to be found, you see. But notice what he does with regard to this parched condition. Do you see the irony between 2 and 3? Well, my soul thirsts for God in verse 2. In verse 3, he says, my tears have been my food. In other words, he is hydrating his cheeks, even though he doesn't seem to be hydrating his soul. <sighs> this is hard. And he's grappling now with the Awareness of God and the experiences of life. And trying to understand the here and the now of God. And so he, he begins to ponder all of this. And he, he looks at this. And he begins to think through very carefully. Why is it that I'm expressing outwardly? I'm hydrating my, my, my face. But right now I am longing to hydrate my soul. My tears have been my food. And notice that uh, this is not just late at night. Has this been your experience at certain times? Day and night. And now, to top it off, around him there's these people. Now he's not that spiritual or socially uh, disconnected. There are people around him. But what I want to say is that these are not what I'll call his people. I put it another way, these are the people that don't get it. They see that he is down. And so they've got this assumption about the God that he supposedly worships. Shades of Job and his counselors at this point. While they say to me all the day long, man, this is tiring. Where is your God? In John Bunyan's classic allegory, Pilgrim's Progress, follow the hero Christian. He's on a journey from the city of destruction to what's known in, in the 
incredible book, Pilgrim's Progress, The Celestial City. And along the way, he becomes buddy with somebody else. And they approach, I'm going to quote now in older English, a very miry sloth that was in the midst of the plain. And they, being heedless, did both fall suddenly into the bog. And the name of the sloth was Despond. It's kind of like the quicksand of life. And so there they are, stuck. And Christian, because of the burden that's on his back, and he is Christian, yet carrying a burden on his back, he's beginning to sink. Now his traveling companion manages somehow to get out. You think he's going to give Christian a hand? runs home. You ever felt abandoned? So Christians left struggling in this muddy bog until a man named Help appears on the scene. And in Bunyan's allegory, Pilgrim's Progress, Help is the Holy Spirit. And he pulls him from the pit and sets him on solid ground. Now, Christian, and this grips my attention in the allegory, probably my favorite book after the Bible. Christian asks help why this dangerous plot of land had not been, quote, mended, fixed, so that poor travelers might go on heaven's journey with more security. And help's response Quote, this miry slough is such a place as cannot be mend, mended, unquote. In other words, part of your journey, your life journey, means you're going to find occasionally you're going to be in the slough. You're going to need the Holy Spirit's involvement and engagement to see you through, to move you forward, Because others might be asking at this point, where's your God? So how is he going to handle this? What's he going to do? Now some of us at this point revert to what you and I might call the good old days. So my argument is the good old days were the days prior to the fall of humanity. Okay. After that, no good days. So now, what do you do? He is selective with his memory. He's up now to verse 4. He's choosing what to remember that brings excitement to his soul. Kind of like you might do when you say, I remember that extended, multi-generational, multi-cousin, multi-uncle gathering at some place. It was so much fun back then. And now you feel detached, alone. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. He's longing for that corporate worship experience. Not isolationist, but corporate. He would hear the shouts of verse 4. The glad shouts, he can almost hear it in his soul as he's recalling it in his mind. Songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. What festival, we might be asking ourselves at this point in his time of isolation. Could be Passover, first fruits maybe, tabernacles. Whatever it is, something has so gripped him and he's got to address it. Because this natural tendency now in order to find a new sense of bringing, bringing joy into the now is to look to the past and be selective with his memory. Is that the best way to go? A missionary in India burning with fever of malaria, <coughs> disease sapping her strength, 
a feeling of depression dragged her into the depths of despair. Felt so overwhelmed, she asked God to simply take her home. The biographer tells us one day, while enclosed in this cocoon of despair, the sound of music drifted into her room from another part of the house. A group of Indian young people were having a worship service. She heard them sing in their dialect, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. What I want to say to the psalmist at this point is you're turning back through the usage of selective memory, picking out particular moments as you turn back that are helping you cope with the present. Is there an alternative to coping? In verses 1 through 4, and we noticed how the past is being remembered, it's thought through, then you get to verses 5 through 8, which second of all, deals with how the Lord is being viewed. In verse 5 now, what he does is that he offers himself a spiritual examination. Many of us go through our yearly or our annual physicals. He's taking himself now through his spiritual. No superficial evaluation. I find that when you're dealing with people that are of this, going through this, this challenge in life, it's very difficult to get the energy to be able to pose such questions. Pose any questions. Become increasingly passive. Everything seems to be extraordinarily difficult, takes such effort. True, various forms of depression, genetic, physical, or some form spiritual. In this case, the downcast soul. Notice that at this point, while his critics are asking where, he will take time to ask why. But what I want you to see here is that he does not ask God why. Why am I going through this? No. Instead, it's almost as if he is about to do self-counseling with his soul. It's almost as if he's treating his soul as a person. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Now bear in mind that if he's in the wilderness, as we covered in Psalm 23 in a two-part series, now this is a two-parter, is that when sheep get in the cast position, they're on their backs and the legs are upward, and if a shepherd does not come along to set them back up on their feet, they will die. And so what we see here now is that the cast down, downcast condition has got to be addressed. He is shepherding his own soul, which is what we do with biblical truth. Posing the question to self, why are you downcast, cast down, O my soul? And furthermore, why are you in turmoil within me? It's an intense word. Here's the idea that the soul is a battlefield at this point. Is that where your life is at? Is that where your soul is at? (sighs) I'm now the most miserable man living, said one political leader. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on earth. To remain where I am is impossible. 
I must die or get better. So said Abraham Lincoln. What we're saying is that those who appear to have it together outwardly might have everything coming apart inwardly. And the antidote now is to go deep. Put together what has come apart. So now, self counsel He doesn't ask, where are you, God? <laughs> That's what the critics have been asking. Instead, he goes deep. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Another why question. Why are you in turmoil within me? And now what I want to be able to say this morning is that after beginning to work through diagnosis, here comes prescription. Hope in God. For I shall again praise him. Do you see? And this is astounding, but if you are battling this form of depression this morning, typically there's a disconnect between depression and determination. Because determination takes energy. Depression saps energy. Depression leaves us in a state of passivity, not proactivity. So counter this tendency now by identifying we've got a soul issue on our hands. I will take the initiative not to question why are those within my family whatever disconnected from where I'm at emotionally, but rather I want to make sure that I am not disconnected from God spiritually. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? But now notice the connection he now makes. Here's the antidote. Here's the prescription. He says to the soul, he's counseling his own soul. Hope in God. For I shall again praise him. In other words, he's saying, there's a future here for me. I get where I'm at. I shall again praise him. And now what I want you to see here is that he says, number one, my salvation. Number two, my God. See how far he's come already through self-counsel? Why in verse one, so pants my soul for you, O oh God, to now he's reached a point in his counsel, my God. So now he begins to work with this. He infuses new perspective into this. He says, my soul is cast down within me. So now you feel the pendulum swinging back and forth. So typical in matters of depression. Right when you think you're making progress, three steps forward, here comes two steps back. My soul is cast down within me. But now what I want you to see here is that he again uses this matter of the memory. Remember how in verse 4 he said, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God? It's as if he's been dislocated from his role in life. Verse 4, it seems to be, he seems to be saying, I can't figure out my identity now. I'm no longer doing what I did. But now, memory, which can be a, either a weapon to fight with or a tool to work with, becomes his tool. Therefore, I remember you. Doesn't say, I remember the good old days. I remember you. He's making a connect in a time of disconnect. He might be removed and in an exile from Israel, but there's a connection. Oh, geographically, 
I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Metzir. But now using the, the imagery of an ocean. And generally speaking, the Jewish people are not drawn to the sea. Deep goes to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and all your waves have gone over me. In other words, he's saying, I'm overwhelmed. Feelings have come back. Oh, you need to listen to Matt Redman, psalmist. God, you can tell the waves to be still. Tell the ocean roar to pass. Lord, until it does, I'll wait here. God, you can part the raging sea, bring the miracle I need. Lord, until it comes, I'll wait here. Get this. And I will sing songs in the night, praise in the storm. You're God in it all. Connect that. To verse 8. Even in his most overwhelmed state, he shifts from G O D to L O R D, all capitalized by day, the Lord, Yahweh. See how he's moving forward? Maybe it's three steps forward, two steps back, but we still got a step going our way. By the day, by day, the Lord commands. It's interesting that he's commanding his Hesed. He is commanding his steadfast love, which has to do with loyal love. At night, his song is with me. In other words, there's a song of the Savior. At night, his song is with me. That inspires a prayer to the God of my life. And Matt Redman nods his head. I'll sing songs in the night, praise in the storm. You're God in it all, and I'll stand, I'll be still, and know whatever may come, you're God in it all. What have we said so far? Verses 1 through 4, we've noted how the past is being remembered. And in verses 5 through 8, how the Lord is being viewed. Finally, he got the Yahweh in there. Lord, capital L-O-R-D. But we need a third to wrap it up today. Because thirdly, how the questions are being answered. Because he's got questions. Because in nine, he, he says, I say to God, and he's now got his footing. After all that time of feeling overwhelmed and as if he was about to drown, my rock, here comes back to you again. Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? He feels as though people around him just don't get it and they're critiquing, they're criticizing him, they don't understand what he's going through inwardly. And so he uses a physical illustration of a spiritual dimension of his life in ten. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me shades of Job, his supposed counselors, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? After he's just gotten to the point of saying, my God, now he's got to deal with that question. Uh, just how personal really is this? So what do you do with all that? How the questions are being answered? He poses the critical question. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? He's going to counsel the soul, his soul. Another why. Why are you in turmoil within me? And now for the second time, here is the prescription, because sometimes the prescription is overlooked, set aside, first go around. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. 
And now he personalizes my salvation and my God. It happened. Several years ago, a teacher assigned to visit children at a large city hospital got a routine call requesting she visit a particular child. Took the boy's name, room number, told by the teacher at the other end of the line, we're studying nouns and adverbs in class now. Be thankful if you could just help him with his homework so he doesn't fall behind. It wasn't until the visiting teacher got outside the boy's room that she realized it was located in the hospital's burn unit. And no one had prepped her to find a young boy horribly burned and greatly pained. And she felt that she couldn't just turn and walk away, so she awkwardly stammered, I'm the hospital teacher, and your, your teacher sent me to help you with nouns and adverbs. You'll love what comes next. The next morning, a nurse in the burn unit asked her, what did you do to that boy? Before she could finish a profusion of apologies, the nurse interrupted, you don't understand. We've been worried about him. But ever since you were here yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's fighting back. It's responding to treatment. It's as though he's decided to live. The boy explained. He had given up hope until he saw that teacher. It had all changed when he came to a simple realization. And with tears coming down his cheeks, he put it this way, quote, they wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dying boy, would they? Unquote. He found hope. So what I want to say this morning, here and again next week, pose that question. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope into God, for I shall again praise him rather than turning to the past, connect the past, present to the future. My salvation, my God, antidote hope. And now we replace coping. with hoping. To be continued. Let's stand together. And so, Father, we've explored 11 verses. feel like I've just scratched the surface, as always. <coughs> Forgive me. But, Father, what we need is a fresh encounter with the living God who provides the living water tied to our living Savior. For anybody watching online now, coming days, for all that have been present, the many in this building today, and we entered with parched souls, I pray now that we're finding living water pouring it deep. And now, Father, we've created some elasticity within our souls to take and still more water, more water, more water. Refresh now that person. May they leave with a new sense of hope. Don't have to keep looking back and being selective with memory. Can look ahead and be reinvigorated because we've got a living God who offers living hope through living water, through our living Savior, Jesus Christ. And for this, we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.